Um, my name is Doug Valenta. My name is John Zajac. And we are partners in life, and together we're also the co-creators of something called Moat. Um, you may have seen me at the last Neuroscope a couple of years ago uh, talking about Moat, talking about building narrative chat and um, <laughs> this technology that we built. And honestly, at the time, I don't think we really understood nearly enough about it. Uh, and we certainly understood, didn't understand nearly as much about it as we did today. And we're kind of back with an update um, that we hope will inspire all of you. Um, so Moat is an online system for real-time collaborative storytelling. If you saw the last talk, this is very similar to what we were talking about it as then. Players use a chat-based system and a special notation to describe characters, speech, thoughts, feelings, and actions to collaboratively create a narrative that all gets rendered as prose on the screen. Um, so it's definitely uh, not a game, but it is some kind of an interactive narrative thing. And it took us a while to figure out what kind of thing that was. Yeah. Um, and something we were noticing when we were playing it was that um, uh, there's, I think I talked in 2020 about this uncanny feeling of both reading and writing at the same time. Um, but we also noticed that there were elements of timing. Um, beyond mm. just the normal piecing of a, of a written story, there was an element of at what time does a, does a piece of text appear on the screen? Yeah, like comic timing started to come into play, right? Absol and, in a, yeah, absolutely. In a way that, that, that it just doesn't exist in, in static prose. And, um, you know, that, you know, really kind of got our gears turning. And we started to think about um, what we were doing when we were playing Moat as we had this very clunky word for it at the moment that was no. called, we were talking about it as story jazz. I, don't know, I think it's kind of cool. I felt kind of cool playing story jazz. I know, but you can't really it. say it to anybody. You yeah, can't be like, you if you want to play story jazz, no, that sounds lame. Nobody wants to but play But like, that. you know, I, I think what it, you know, John and I both have a music background. We're both accomplished musicians. Um, and I personally have a jazz background as well. And, you know, it just reminded me so much of that feeling of when you're with a, a group of people, large or small, mm -hmm. who are all playing jazz together, whether that's just some changes that you've, you've come up with, or if it's like a, an actual song that you're playing, but then improvising around. And that feeling of the, the exchange of, of ideas, the ability to surprise yourself, not just surprise the people you're playing yeah. with, but to be able to surprise yourself with what you're creating. The the serendipity of the output, right? Yeah. When you're playing in a band like that and you're you're creating music together in the moment. And you're you're just using these skills that you have and this these abilities that you've developed to create something that's, you know, completely new, right? Yeah. With a whole group of other people. And it, it's weird because it feels the feeling is what led us to story jazz and what led us to narrative instruments, which is yeah. this kind of perilous feeling, right? There's a sense of anticipation and excitement, but there's also this kind of like, holy crap, what are we doing? Is this going to work out? Like, yeah. it, it might not yeah, work and out. like, I think that the, um, you know, it, it also, to me, also beckon, you know, harkens the fact that like, you know, a lot of playing that, you know, my, my friend, my best friend from college, her parents had something that they used to say about jazz. I don't know if you agree with it, but they always used to say, it sounds like it's more fun to play than it is to listen to. <laughs> and I, you know, but I think there's a, a, a there's some truth in that, which is that uh, like a huge amount of the fun of jazz is the fun of playing jazz. Yeah. And uh, it's a very different experience than listening to jazz. And often people play are playing jazz just for the fun of playing it and not because they're trying to perform for an audience. So this this kind of this kind of feelings that we were getting when we were playing, this is early on in the development phase of Moat. So I just think like, wait, if this feels that way, is what we're playing an instrument? Yeah. And so we kind of got to this idea of narrative instruments. And the first thing that we learned about narrative instruments is that we were not the first people to make up the idea of narrative instruments. <laughs> so we kind of have traced this back to this this paper in 2003. By the way, it's wild to read these and just From be the like, future. and feel like, I, yeah, right. Like I had come home. Like I was like, these people know me. I feel seen. <laughs> but this this paper, like no order for an, it's uh, from instrumental text to textual instruments. And uh, you know, in this in this paper, the idea of a textual instrument is a play on words that Noah is creating and 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 turning around, uh, you know, uh, rhetorically. Um, you know, that is, that is a play on the word instrumental text, which I don't feel like has really survived that much, but it's something people were talking about at the time. And when he said was instrumental texts are said to be played in an analogy to musical instruments. However, the play material is predetermined. Textual instruments, and he's putting it in quotes, on the other hand, can play many compositions, and each composition can produce many different textual outcomes. And he followed this paper up with more like a longer form essay, kind of ex expounding on his thought process and kind of his relationship to this idea and um, this playable media and textual instruments. 
and you know was kind of continuing to expand this idea more um but it kind of didn't really you know come up again until 2021 this paper uh by max kraminski and michael matthias toward narrative instruments and this is kind of our entry point to the you know other other people talking about narrative instruments i had the pleasure of getting to meet max at Neuroscope in 2020 and that's how i ended up finding out about this paper while they were still writing it um and you know here they are even expanding further on this this relationship to musical instruments um, an explicit relationship between narrative and, mu and musical instruments. Notice that the terminology has evolved from textual instrument to narrative instrument. Um, and they're talking quite a bit about some of the features of musical instruments. So that got us kind of thinking. Yeah. So, so I think like... I can just roll through I this. know, right? So I, I think we know what a narrative is, right? <laughs> Hopefully most of us here know what a narrative is. And I think we see a lot of examples in these papers about what narrative instruments could do. Like, what, what can they do, do we think? What is speculation about that? But I think one thing that as we started to realize that, you know, maybe we had made a narrative instrument, we started to realize we needed to have a more specific definition of what an instrument was, right? right. Because we needed a foundation for how to approach if this was going to inform our design, if this was going to inform what we were making, we needed to have something that was a little more specific than just speculation about what you could use an instrument for. Yeah, I think, for. I think whenever you're working with an analogy, there's work to be done to make that analogy functional and, yeah. and be something that can lead to validating existing design ideas, but also um, you know, discovering new design ideas that come out of that analogy. So kind of John and I worked together to put together you know, our own version, our take, on what are the properties of instruments, thinking first about musical instruments and then strip away the music part, right? Mm -hmm. So probably the first of those that is mentioned in a couple of these papers is that they require skill to be used effectively. Um, that sounds really obvious. I think we all can just know that instinctively about music instruments, but it's not true of a lot of other kinds of interactive narrative, right? Um, we don't, we don't, you know, although it might require player skill to make it through a game, it usually doesn't require like, you know, special skills that they developed to operate it, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, there's a lot of design dedicated to taking all of those skills into a meme that's really accessible to smoothing that people, over. smoothing it over. Yeah. So another thing about instruments is that they're assistive and not generative. Um, so, you know, they are not generating, you know, a musical instrument doesn't generate music. Um, to entertain uh, a, a, a operator. Mm -hmm. It is assisting an operator in creating their own music, and that's because the player is the artist. Um, this is something we're going to come back to over and over again. This word is really important to us, thinking about players as artists. I love some of these words that we're working with here, play, player. They have so many meanings mm -hmm. in so many places. We talk about actors as players. We talk about musicians as players. We talk about game consumers as players. Yeah. And I think we later on we start to talk a little bit about like how, you know, some things that we think of as games, but actually have huge elements of art in terms of the, the empowerment they give to people to be expressive. Mm -hmm. And um, so the next level of instruments, the next characteristic that we thought of is that they're fundamental to an artistic performance, not incidental. I like to say on this one, it's that you can't use a violin to play the piano. Yeah. They are, they are, they are, if you're performing something, the instrument that you're using to perform it is a fundamental part of that, just as much as the artist. It is the, it is the two of them working together to create this performance. And if you switch out that instrument, um, it, it completely changes what the performance is and its capabilities in the expressive range. Yeah. And following from this, their design has intrinsic defining limitations affecting that output, right? So on a, on a violin, you have a limit, limited palette of tones you can create, a limited number of passages you can play. Um, now, those limitations are not small. Violins have a huge amount of versatility, but they certainly don't have the same versatility or the same use that a piano does, and that's by design. And yeah. that's really important when you think about and, and vice instrument. versa. It's not that the piano is a is a more versatile instrument than, yeah. the, than the violin. It's that it has different versatility, right? Mm -hmm. One of the defining limitations. This is, this is my Galaxy brand. One of the yeah. defining limitations of a piano is that it isn't a violin, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree. Um, no more controversy in this talk. Um, <laughs> and so finally, um, instruments are not texts 
templates or frameworks, right? This, uh, it feels really uncontroversial when we apply it to music. I think that, you know, it, it's really stretching the definition of the word instrument. If we were to say that the New World Symphony is a musical instrument or that the 12 bar blues is a musical instrument or that the, uh, you know, the sonata form is a musical instrument. They're texts that can be played on musical instruments. Some of them are barely texts. They're ideas about kinds of texts that can be played on musical instruments. Um, but when we map that to narrative, it's important to be careful um, and, and understand whether and, and use that to guide us, to help us understand if we're thinking about an instrument or if we're thinking about a text. Yeah. And so all those properties together led us to our, this is our working definition for today of instrument. Um, I changed during the talk. <laughs> this has changed 20 times in the past three months. But uh, <laughs> our working definition of an instrument is um, an assistive technology that is operated by an artist to produce a performance. And I've underlined two words here that are really important. Artist is super important, already kind of covered that, but also performance. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what distinguishes instruments from other kinds of tools that are used to create art, um, is that an, interest, an instrument is used to create a performance, which is a specific kind of art. I'm not gonna get now into defining performance, but we'll just go with the idea that everyone knows what a performance is. But what, you know, we know what a musical performance is, but what is a narrative performance? That sounds kind of exotic. Like, yeah, did, did we just make I can't up, even imagine. Did we just make up something crazy? Yeah. And the answer is no. We already know what narrative performance is. It's just is. theater. It's theater. Yeah, it's we, telling you know, stories. Narrative performance is theater. And I guess that tells us that story jazz is theater. It's, it's improvisational theater. Mm -hmm. And that kind of helps, right? <laughs> you, know, and, you know, what's interesting is that it helps us in this kind of new space, which is, you know, using these instruments in practice. It helps give us even more kind of legs to draw from and analogies to draw from. And you see that kind of as we move through the talk and we explore more what this is. Yeah, but let's it, explore what narrative performance is first so that we have a good place to... Well, I think the theater, the, the idea that it's theater brings us directly into one of the main reasons why people already in the world engage in narrative performance. And that's because they want to put on a show for other people. Sometimes they want to put on a show for people who don't know that they're having a show put on for them. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but they have this desire to turn other people into an audience for some spectacle that they're going to create for them. And we see that all over the world. We see it throughout many different cultures, but we also see it online. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so that's, that's one aspect of why people uh, perform narratives. Another that's a little bit different is that they want to role play, which is just a kind of imaginative play. It's something that happens as a component of playing a role playing game, but it can also just be done on its own. Online, we see this, we kind of mostly associate this with forums and maybe chat communities, but this is also what, you know, LARPers do. And this is also a big part of the SEA, right? These people are performing, but they're performing for themselves and for one another and not for an audience. And I think that's really cool. And I think we would be missing something if we left off this idea that performance can also be a tool for artifact production, right? So we talked about, you know, instruments being different from other tools and that they're used to perform, but you can also record a performance mm -hmm. and take that recording and use it as the raw input material for some second order artistic process, like making a film or a television show out of actors' performances. Yeah, it extends the public spectacle, right? You wanna show off what you did yeah. to more and more people. Even though those original performances might have been private. Yeah, right, that's true. So if we know what a performance is, a narrative performance, then like why performance, narrative performance is important. Why are narrative instruments important to the idea of narrative performance? Yeah, and I think with all in instruments, what we see is that instruments allow players to create performances that they couldn't create with their bodies alone, right? Mm -hmm. So that's true of musical instruments. Musical instruments make sounds that human bodies can't make. And that's... Part, that's really the big draw of playing a musical instrument is that it's a different way of making sound than you can make sound with your body. I guess you are often using musical instruments with your body, but the instrument is is an extension of your body that, that does something else. And the same is true within the narrative performance space, even if we think about IRL, um, with puppetry, right? We, yeah. use, we can use puppets to create performances that we couldn't create with our body when actors put on little dots on front of a green screen and <laughs> animate like a computer animation. That's a puppetry performance that they're, mm -hmm. they're doing, right? And, you know, we can extend that into, to, into thinking about how digital instruments um, just further allow players to bring narrative performances to places that they cannot inhabit with their physical bodies. Mm -hmm. 
and also to perform in formats that um, their bodies can't perform in, and like pros, like yeah. like what Moat does. But you could probably theorize many other ways. You know, I think that you know, uh, like animated avatars or like you know. Um, so yeah. Things like that can also be a way that that players can use a a virtual puppet to create a performance. I think we're seeing this progression, right? Of like as we start to develop new technologies and new ways of making instruments, people can make instruments that are even more, you know, uh, advanced and create even more opportunities for expressive range and more opportunity for doing things. And yeah. narrative instruments are one of those. I mean, yeah. you look at prose, that's a great point that without this digital tool, without the digital space, it'd be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for people to play a prose, yeah. like a piece of prose as an instrument to be contributing to that like it's jazz. Yeah. So that's like closing out our introduction. For the rest of this talk, we have six insights that we want to share with you today mm -hmm. that come out of our experience as practitioners in this space. Mm -hmm. And our goal today is really to just add our perspective to this growing conversation about narrative instruments and also to inspire you to join us, both as players of narrative instruments, but also as designers and makers of narrative instruments. And also to, to start thinking about just this idea of the power of instruments to performance and the power of performance for people. And to think about how, you know, you can bring ideas of performance and ideas of, uh, you know, narrative instruments or puppets um, into, um, you know, other kinds of interactive narrative experiences that you might be working on creating. And so I think if we're gonna if we're gonna step back, the place to step back to to get started on these insights is a little rewind, a little rewind down to story jazz, right? So story jazz, where this really so the story of kind of how we started playing this is that we were like, oh, look at this cool thing we made. We had no idea what it was. I mean, you you have to understand we just had this line, and when you wrote on it, it made prose with other people, and that was just like so. A let's get on there and play. play. Yeah. So we would we would call up our friends and we'd be like, hey, we have this cool weird new thing. Why don't you come on and play? And they would show up and we would, we'd be like, okay, what do we do? And we would be like, well, oh, you know what? Let's just kind of make something up in the spot. Let's improvise, right? We're all theater people. We're all music people. Yeah. We have lots of friends in those spaces. Lots of people that kind of have this background in improvisation. Although or I, want to, I want to say, I don't even know if it really occurred to us at the time that that's what we were doing. Yeah. I think we, we thought we'd get on the thing and it didn't occur to us that there was any other way to use it. But of yeah. course, we would just kind of go on and make something up. Right. That's the fun. Right. Make something up. Everybody wants to make something up. Right. Yeah. Just make up a story and maybe decide the characters or like maybe you're on like a, a moon base or something. And there's like some sort of alien incursion or whatever. Just whatever. Like we yeah. can make up anything. I think that what we found out, though, is that when we started exposing more to more people, especially after Neuroscope 2020, we started opening up our closed beta program more. We started bringing in a lot of people that we didn't know. Poor, unfortunate souls would wander into our Discord server, and we would say to them, let's improvise. And yeah, the reaction know. that we got was, uh, you know, often a little bit uh, scared. <laughs> yeah, a little deer in headlights moment. And I think, you know, here's the thing, though. I can't judge that. Like, after my long experience doing a ton of improvisation in music and in theater, that feeling of perilousness, that feeling that I may fail at any moment, right? That this thing, this art that I'm making may just totally collapse into like a car crash yeah. was something I was used to. But especially when you think of something like, I kind of enjoyed it. Yeah. But what's interesting about it is that especially when you're thinking about, about that, right? And yeah. Especially when you think about writing, uh -huh. no one's used to this idea that they're writing for people, that their writing is performative, that there's a perilousness to the sentence they wrote that yeah. it may screw up. And so it was this combination of factors that realized that if you're going to do something with a narrative instrument, especially, especially when it involves prose and text, you are absolutely going to need something to play. And yeah. so this is our first insight that we really just came to as we started to realize that Moat was a narrative instrument, was that we had to make material so that people had a solid footing, so that they could actually start focusing on, just like you have a score, just like you have a lead sheet, right? Just like you have a script. Well, that you're leading into something really important, which is that the really good news is there's already tons of material for you to play. So any kind of story, everybody knows, and everybody knows, importantly, everybody knows how it ends, <laughs> and everybody knows who the characters are, and they, maybe they have a favorite character. Um, those are, those are you know, really, you know, perfect stories for you to try out playing on a narrative instrument and um, being able to perform, because they answer a lot of the questions that come up during 
during play. Mm -hmm. You know, another example is plays. Plays are literally texts that are written to be performed. They are pre-created narratives for you to perform. And any narrative instrument, you should be able to create some kind of an adaptation of a play for that instrument. You're always going to be adapting because most things aren't really created to be played. Certainly, if you've created a new piece of technology, nothing's ever been created to be played on it, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that adaptation process is usually a lot simpler than, than just telling people to make something up. And then there's a whole world out there, tabletop role-playing games and story games. These are basically frameworks that are designed to help people make up a story together that they all enjoy performing together as part of what we were talking about earlier, RP, role-play. And, um, you know, these are also really great tools to use to, to get people into playing a narrative instrument and partly because they're really interactive and you're still making things up. They can be an on-ramp to improvisation. And sometimes we found as we were playing a game, the game itself would start to slip away because we would start feeling comfortable enough creating the story ourselves. The narrative would actually become the focus rather than the game, right? So there but, are so lots of these games out there that you can just grab off the shelf and play. Some of the ones that we've had a lot of fun with are you know Fiasco, Lovecraft Ask, and then for the past several months we've been playing. This is probably the most game one, like the most like RPG one of all of these. Mm -hmm. Brindlewood Bay with a group of friends every week, and um, you know I think the big thing we found with all of these is you know often we use the rules less than uh, you might use them when you're not playing on an instrument. The instrument itself made us feel like we didn't need the rules as much to help guide us. Um, but, you know, they were still, like, a great framework and a great, like, net to catch yeah. us um, yeah. and, so, and, and as, like, a, like a support tool yeah. um, to, to, you know, play stories. And we well, actually – go ahead. Well, I was going to say in some of the thorniest – thornier aspects, right, of putting together a story, structuring it, deciding on its tone, deciding on its genre. They're figured out for They're you. figured out in these, right, because yeah. that's part of the design of a story game is you're figuring that out for people to perform in, like, in person. But – so the adaptation is really, really simple. And we talked a little bit earlier about having an artifact, right? Having some output. And one of my favorite things to do is to read our Lovecraft S games, right? They read. Oh, they're great. Like horror novels. They're great. It's insane. I feel, I personally, Lovecraft S is an amazing game by Becky Anderson and Joss Fox. Um, and it's for creating stories that really have the vibe of um, of an HP Lovecraft story, which are written stories. Mm -hmm. And I truly feel like Moat is the native uh, <laughs> format for that game. I haven't convinced them of that, yeah. but I really feel like it is. I love it. Um, so in like Brindlewood is an amazing reading. We have, I think, 14 chapters. It's been amazing. So we realized how fun this was was to play these games and we realized there's a huge opportunity here to to design have you know design our own games design our own yeah. experiences that are actually focused on mode and explore mode as an instrument right because you when you write for example a violin sonata you're writing specifically for the violin when you write a piano sonata you're writing for the piano and if mode is a narrative instrument, we need to be writing experiences and creating experiences specifically for it. And yeah. so about a year ago, we uh, contacted a bunch of incredibly brilliant people. You might recognize a couple of the names on here, like Aaron Reed, um, to look at moat and to create experiences, create games that people could play on them. Um, this was a really cool opportunity to get to, you know, expose some other designers to Moat and get them thinking about it, get, see what they wanted to see, be able to be created uh, using Moat and, um, you know, also just, uh, you know, see what they did with it. Um, and these are also just like great tools, especially for people who are getting started to be able to go in and play. It's already adapted to Moat, so they don't have to do that work. They don't have to understand Moat to be able to understand how to play this game on it. And, um, you know, they're one-shot games, so they're also like perfect for that, 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 you know, welcome to our Discord game, right? But they may, they may not need to adapt them, but one thing they do need, and this is something we realized after we were making this material, is that they need to still know how to play the thing, play the instrument, yeah. right? If I handed this to you um, and I just said, do something, would you be like, so I just blow in this, right? <laughs> and what would come out if you just blowed in it? It would be bad. It would be it terrible. Would be really that's an aspect of instruments that's incredibly important, which yeah. is that you can make really bad stuff, right? It can be really bad. Yeah. And that's one of our next insight, which is you're going to be bad. And I want to like sit on this one for a second because like this is, it's it's so obvious that like, of course, if you're playing an instrument for the first time, you're going to be bad. But when you are the designer of an instrument and you create it and you sit down to play it for the first time, it 
feels completely jarring and counterintuitive that you're bad. And honestly, you might not realize at first that you're bad. What you realize over time is that you are, you are not getting consistent results. You yeah. are realizing that um, the instrument is capable of doing so much more than what you're actually doing with it. And you might wonder why. And the answer is because you're bad. And you're, and how bad are you? You are a total beginner. And this yeah. is true for the designers. It's true of the designers. It's true of the people that are approaching it for the first time, players. And, you know, that total beginnerness, at least for, like, our narrative instrument, starts with you can't produce anything worthwhile or coherent. The first time you get on there, you are just going to be playing around, and, and it's going to seem really crazy. But as you keep playing, as you keep getting experience with it, you're going to start seeing results, and you're going to start to, for example, play something that seems coherent but has numerous mistakes. Um, and eventually you're going to be inconsistently producing something that's decent. The experience is decent. The output is decent. And this keeps going. There's this mysterious force as you keep playing. Um, this is going to be mind-blowing to, to y'all. Um, there's this mysterious force as you keep playing and getting experience and, and correcting your mistakes that lifts up this line. And this line, that's called practice, right? Practice, practice, practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice. Right. Um, and, you know, I want to say one thing about mistakes, and that's that mistakes are always part of live performance. Mm -hmm. All actors make mistakes. All all professional actors make mistakes. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, every every professional musician makes mistakes in every mm -hmm. performance that they that they do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, learning to to live with mistakes, learning to love your mistakes, learning to recover from your mistakes is another skill that you're building as you are not being a, a beginner anymore. But how do you know what to practice? Right. Like we talked about it as this invisible force that just kind of like magically makes you better. Mm. But if you can practice, then you can practice specific things. And if we go back to the analogy from music, then we know that the, the name of the thing that it is that you practice when you are practicing music is technique. Yeah. Um, and so that's our next insight. That narrative instruments require technique. Technique is the set of skills that are required for artists to consistently express what they want to express with their instrument. Um, so we've, I've got some examples up here for two musical instruments, the mm -hmm. piano and the oboe. And you can see that these cover a wide variety of different you know, activities mm -hmm. that you need to be able to execute consistently on both of these instruments to be successful. With the piano, it includes the posture that you use to sit with at the keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, it includes uh, being able to use the pedal consistently and effectively. It includes the span of your hand, of being able to actually stretch your fingers to reach, say, a 15th. Um, whereas on the oboe, we've got a very different list of things. Um, we've got breathing, the ability to produce air from your lungs and move it through the instrument consistently. Embouchure refers to being able to hold your lips in the tight pose um, mm -hmm. that is necessary to be able to get the reed to, to vibrate. Um, and then one that at the bottom that maybe you might not be aware of is that professional oboists make their own reeds. It's a whole side, like crafting a skill line mini game that they have to do yeah. of like whittling reeds out of cane yeah. and, um, you know, and binding them to corks with threads. And this is the reason why I quit the oboe because reed making sucks and <laughs> all, none of the reeds work. And so the whole point of this is not to turn this into a talk about like the technique of music, but what it is supposed to point out is that these are two different instruments. They're both musical instruments but they have fundamentally and completely different technique that you have to figure out. And to go back to our definition of instruments, part of the reason for this is because of those limiting designs, because of the uniqueness of the instrument, right? The unique so physical form. You, need, you have this form and you need to create technique that teaches people how to use that specific form. And so we realized that if mode is an instrument, we need to figure out what these techniques are because we didn't want everybody to go through that process of two years of just like messing around and trying to figure it out. That's well, not well. This efficient. taught us that we, this taught us that you know that whatever goes here in these blanks is going to be mode specific. But that's kind of scary because it means that nobody can answer for it for us, and we can't really answer it through an analogy to music. And that, and that gets a little scary at first, right? Because here it is. I'm just going to say, go make a technique for this thing. Yeah. And I, I mean, I making a technique is not something that many people have a background in. I don't think it's not really a common activity. And so if it's just technique is just out here alone, that becomes really scary. But, but luckily, technique doesn't exist in a vacuum, yeah. right? Like technique exists in conversation also with the theory of an art form mm -hmm. and also the artistry. Right. So we can think of theory as like the kind of like fundamental elements of an art form. I've got examples here from music. Theory is the fundamental art elements of an art form that you're using technique to learn how to 
how to consistently manipulate. Um, whereas artistry, these are your artistic goals. This is what you're trying to create. This is why you do what you do. This is what you're trying to create. Um, the effects that you're trying to create. And we, the, the great thing is these aren't instrument specific, but they are music specific, but we already have these for narrative. So this is our list. This is not a complete list. Your list might be different and that's okay. But if we were to put together a list of the theory of narrative and the artistry of narrative, um, you know, we would say that on the theory side, we'd have these kind of fundamental elements um, of character setting, um, plot and pacing. And on the artistry side, we've got those narrative effects, those narrative goals, those artistic goals that an artist creating a narrative has to create suspense, to create humor, to create irony, right? And um, so that means that the techniques are going to be things that we use that work, the proven mm -hmm. proven tactics yep. for achieving these artistry goals within the context of the theory. So that's helped us to start to develop a set of techniques for moat that we use. I don't think this is a complete list. I don't think that it's a final list, but it's kind of one that we've been working with with today as we've realized that we can develop a list of techniques. There are There is a way where we can make up strategies that help us, and then we can practice them and get better at them, and then we can teach other people how to do them. Yeah, and I mean, just to look at some of these, right, like typing, <laughs> that seemed kind of obvious. Like, you know, it seems like, well, yeah, but, it, but it's a major part of the mechanical interface, yeah. right? That you have to interface with the narrative instrument that we created. So you need to have a certain level of typing in order to be able to have facility uh, contributing to a story on mode, right? Uh, another similar item is notation. You have to understand the basics of notation in order to, of the notation. And notation is... Uh, are the very simple commands that we use in the actual moat system so that you can um, contribute to the story and so the narration engine knows what you're doing. But then there are other things like pre-writing, which is anticipating and talking to your fellow storytellers. Basically typing in a command in advance that you, you want to get in. but At exactly the right time. Well, typing it in first yeah. and then waiting and hitting enter at exactly the right moment. Right? Yep. And so there's emote chaining. So emotes are how you share actions on, on moat. And so, so how your character expresses what they're doing and what they're feeling. And there are times when you want to say a bunch of emotes in the same, like in a, in a chain so that you can tell your part of the story, but you also want to make sure the narration engine is combining those, that you're collaborating, that it's actually making that prose, it's rendering that prose. And so you can chain emotes together using a semicolon. And so these are just some of the techniques that we've created in order to help people achieve greater levels of artistry um, and to be able to play uh, our narrative instrument a little bit more effectively. And that effectiveness, that kind of ability to play it effective is an incredibly important idea and an important thing to realize. And this was one of the biggest realizations that we had for having new players come in for introducing people to the platform, which is that the reward for playing instruments has a technique threshold. And you see this red line, that red line is the technique threshold. The blue line is the reward. It's the joy you get from playing. And this black line is technique. So it's this actual, am I achieving the technique? Do I have the technique I need to do what I wanna do? And you'll notice this place to the left of the red line. And it is, um, that's a struggle. Like anyone who plays instruments, anyone who's been an artist knows that there's, there are these times when you're first starting to learn the technique of, of what you want to do, of the instrument you want to use, where you cannot achieve your goals. You can't achieve the art, the expression that you want. And that's very frustrating. And so there's this technique threshold. And the reason that that's important is because improving technique, getting people to that technique threshold and then beyond it usually requires instruction and practice. And these are really labor intensive. Right. So instruction super labor intensive. We all know practice. Nobody wants to practice. I have two degrees in performance arts and I never wanted to practice. And it's one of those things that like understanding that helps you understand another phenomenon that we started to notice, which is that some players just don't improve no matter what. And this is something that we know from mu music pedagogy. Right. Yep. Is that some players who some players who begin playing a musical instrument will never improve. And so what that leads us to is that most beginners, when you have an instrument, most beginners are not going to become intermediate players. And those beginners just drop off. They, they mm -hmm. never become intermediate players and, and they never really take to the inter instrument. They might take to another one. They might come back years later and, and really get yeah. into it. But 
um, you know, most of the time they're kind of going to bounce somewhere in that early stage, but really we think it's before they hit that, that reward threshold that we showed, right? And in the same vein, most intermediate players will never become advanced. If you think about the number of students who join band in, in elementary school, and then the number of students who remain in high school, and then the number of students who actually go to college for music performance, mm -hmm. and then the number of those people who actually become professional musicians, it's a, it's a very rapidly narrow funnel right of 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 people going in but i think that something important to realize is that unlike the beginners the intermediate players who don't become advanced often keep playing and so that brings us to our next insight which is to design for intermediate play um so you know as our technique is um you know we can see kind of the technique line coming up here and we can see how we showed that the reward for improving your technique really bursts up at a certain point um but it doesn't do that by magic right that burst up is something that you have to design and this is actually there's actually a lot of um, parallel here with music pedagogy, which is that when a younger person or someone who's just starting an instrument is playing in that kind of struggle space that we talked about down on the on the left hand side, a lot of times the teacher instructor's job is to create as many opportunities and to get them to the point where they can actually get that reward, where they can achieve a goal they have, where they can play something that's really really fun and really beautiful because that causes this spike in joy and reward, yeah. which gives them the motivation to continue forward to reveal more of this space um, that, that is the intermediate play space. Yeah. So one way we thought about this is about creating a destination for beginners to reach mm -hmm. and making that a fertile space for intermediate players to explore. And, you know, part of this is, you know, a way to keep those intermediate players playing, even if they don't improve, but also to give those intermediate players some reason that they want to improve and they want to explore. And that doesn't mean just because you're designing for intermediate play and you're designing this space, it doesn't mean you're ignoring the beginners. What it means is that you want to create that beginner experience that gets them to the intermediate play experience as soon as possible. And a way that you can do that is by kind of scaling um, the way that you, the, the techniques that people use to interface right. with your instrument. Yeah, so I like to think of this as the simplest emote that you can do, slash laugh. It's really easy to just tell somebody who's playing mode for the first time, type in slash laugh, and then they type it in and they see what happens, right? But like the important thing is this is also something that an intermediate player would do all the time. And if you're playing with intermediate or advanced players, even as a beginner, you're able to you're able to contribute to a story that's better than a story that you could create on your own or a story that you could create with just other beginners, and that can be inspiring to you. And over time, you know, you can learn new, you know, additional pieces of notation that are additive, that are adding to what you've been doing and are, uh, you know, kind of, kind of growing your ability to refine what it is that you do um, and, and re refine, you know, your ability to contribute. And, you know, another element of this is also being able to learn from other players, right? So one thing that we've included from really the very early days of Moat, because John always wanted to know what I had done when I put something in. He was always like, how did you do that, right? So, you know, allowing players to be able to learn from one another by just hovering over and getting a tooltip that on every piece of prose will show them the command that the other player entered um, so that they can start learning new skills just kind of by osmosis. And so this kind of brings us to, you know, our next insight, which is designing for expressivity. And we really think of that as the ethos that, uh, that, that we think is a, a really valuable way to be able to design that intermediate space and design a big space for exploration. So when we say design for expressivity, we're talking about one, one element of that is talking about maximizing players' ability to control the output of the instrument. That doesn't mean that players, you know, directly create the output of the instrument, otherwise they're not using an instrument, but it means that they are able to um, reliably put in inputs that get the output that they want and that their, their technique that they're building and the skills that they are building is getting better at reliably creating the inputs. Um, because the outputs are kind of deterministic, I guess, in a way. Um, and another side of that is that when we design for expressivity, we're maximizing the output space that players can, can explore. So if we think about a musical instrument, it has a very large output space. It can play every song ever written, and it can play every song that will ever be written, and also other songs that will never be written. 
right? And so we can kind of visualize this as a two by two where, you know, as expressivity is going up, we've both got a high output space and also high navigability. So navigability would be the player's, player's ability to self-direct their navigation through the output space so that from one place in the output space, they, at a high enough level of skill, at a high enough level of technique, are able to navigate to another area of the output space that they would like to reach or explore. Um, so if we're to kind of start filling in the rest of this chart, um, you know, on the far lower left where we have tiny output space and low navigability, we would have things that are not even interactive narratives. We would have uh, static texts, right, novels, films. Um, above that in terms of, um, you know, output space, but still very low on the navigability scale would be, you know, a procedurally generated text. And I here I think of, you know, like Aaron Reed's Subcutanean. No shade, Aaron. Uh, but it is, it's not highly navigable because you have to order a new book from Aaron to get a random other copy. Um, and so that's not a very easy to navigate output space, um, although it's a great book. Um, if we go into the lower right corner where we've got that higher navigability, but still a smaller output space, we would have things like choice-based text and parser IF, um, things where there's already some kind of a pre-authored text, um, but the player is invited to navigate that text in, in various ways. Right. And then in all the way up in the upper left, we have stuff like emergent narrative, things that are like the outputs of simulations and then also stuff like GPT-3, which I kind of nudge up in terms of navigability. You've at least got maybe some kind of a prompt where you're able to to guide the output in some way. But there's no real way for you to navigate the entire output space, even though the size of the output space is very large. Well, and so if we collapse these down, right, we start to see kind of the the space in which we're playing in terms of, of design priorities right and so we have in this narrative space we've got this automation space and, and a really good example of automation um but the interesting thing is we're just prioritizing expression i think that's something we want to make really clear you can still use automation you can you still have to have a quality focus right, right. you still have to have an experience focus but there's a difference between using automation to further increase the expressive capability. Like, um, a, like a damper pedal is a form of automation on a piano that, that expands the output space and also expand, it, and also it makes that new space fully navigable. Um, same thing like a, like a guitar clip. Um, but you know, on the on the other side of that, you've got like a player piano, which has a much now is 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 working to constrain the output space and also you know vastly reduce navigability. And I think there are examples like this throughout music for both quality and experience. And using this framework has helped us understand a lot better how to approach developing mode as a narrative instrument and keep its qualities keep its expressive qualities. I want to call out one thing too about this quality quadrant which is that the the meaning of this chart is that for a highly expressive experience for a narrative instrument it is possible to use it to create bad art yeah to make something terrible <laughs> and that's terrifying but it's also like a really key element and and what we're yeah. trying to get at here so another way of saying this is that designing for expressivity is about prioritizing a player's goals their artistic goals over other design goals. Um, and so an example of how we've done this in Moat is kind of the transition from personas um, to you know, successor features. So when we first created Moat, uh, back when I was talking here at Nariscope 2020, this is how Moat worked. Um, you know, you had a, every, every player had a persona. This was a character that they created when they started a story. Um, and for the rest of the story, they and only they would narrate this character's actions and dialogue through their chat in a moat. So they were always expressing themselves as this character. And it was cool, it was very fun, right? But what we found was as we were trying to create more complex stories, it was really hard to talk about other things going on, other characters that didn't have a player to play them, to talk about parts of the environment, to talk about the things that we saw and heard. And we would use all these little tricks like, you know, uh, you know, I look at, the big door, and um, I hear the woman say, <laughs> "Yeah." <laughs> uh, so you know, shortly after that, we followed up with the pets feature, and so what pets did, pet pets was a way where you could create these extra little side characters that you could control through remote and chats, and you could equip a pet, and then when you were emoting and chatting, you were playing as them, and then you could equip another pet, and then switch back to your persona, and so pets really increased the output space um, because they allowed us to basically create sentences the subject of which were not 
our persona characters. So it vastly mm. allowed us to create more, you know, types of uh, prose uh, in our stories. Um, but then what we did really just this last year was actually evolve both of these features into something called characters. Characters are something, there's a shared pool of characters. All players can create characters. Any player can equip any character regardless of what player created it. And any player can set any character to be their perspective character, their point of view character, which was the role that the persona used to play. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a, a big revisioning of these, uh, these previous features. But the big thing that characters does is it increases the navigability. It makes it a lot easier for players to to use the pets that they want to use and to be able to 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 self-direct through the performance that they're trying to create and so we can think about how you know the the design for expressivity value that john and i have adopted with mode um allows us to look at these changes at least retroactively mm -hmm. and say did we do the right thing and answer yes well, because we, we were prioritizing expressivity you know well the process of preparing for this talk caused us to be able to like kind of coalesce some of these ideas right they were driving us. We've had conversations and during our product development stuff and during thinking about how can we take Moat to the next level, um, this is kind of how we were thinking, right? Yeah. And I think that that's really, it's really interesting to kind of apply the analogy of the instruments and really look at what that means from a design perspective. Yeah. And, and also what it looks like from a practical perspective, because this talk is called Narrative Instruments in Practice. And our final in insight, our final kind of thing we want to leave you with here is this idea that you have to play, that the practice, we, no, no development would have occurred mm -hmm. if we had dropped off in the beginning and thought we created this thing and it was a struggle. And we're like, this seems kind of cool, but it's hard. Yeah, it's or if we, said, if we said it's perfect, just go play it. Yeah, just do whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, what, what I really say is like all these other insights we learn from play, Yeah. right? And, um, and the, uh, you know, so like, play like part of being a practitioner of designing you know instruments and designing performance media is also performing yourself and playing yourself even if you're not the best player right um m musical instruments are invented by musicians they aren't invest invented by the greatest musicians in the world but they're invented by people who love to play music and are fascinated by creating new ways for them and other people to play music right and i think when you one of the things i really want to get across in the talk is that, you know, Doug and I kind of had an advantage approaching this narrative instrument that we created because we're instrumentalists and because we're musicians. So we kind of understand that glorious struggle and you kind of miss it when you get to a place of proficiency, right? Because it's a constant journey of learning and succeeding and creating new and better things. And it's really vibrant. It's an incredibly vibrant space creatively, which is something I've experienced playing this narrative instrument is I've, I've become more creative. I've become a better writer yeah. and I've become a better storyteller because I'm in that struggle space. I'm in that space where I'm trying to advance and trying to advance my technique. You're really thinking about what you're doing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so I, I think like that's one thing that I want to kind of get out there, which is that I feel like, you know, I have a background also in, in a lot of product design. I have a background in a lot of, of communication. And I feel like there's a lot, there's this kind of feeling sometimes that that struggle space is a place you want to get out of as soon as humanly possible as a designer. But it's, it's actually where it's, it's these spaces of, of struggle where, especially if you're practicing, especially if you're playing, especially if you're moving forward and you're living inside of it, that really give you those insights that let you make something new. Yeah. And yeah. make something really cool and exciting. Yeah. And Moat came from that struggle space. And I, I, I'm really proud of it for that reason. But I also, I kind of missed the struggle space because it was really cool. But we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> Um, but it's nice to at least have an idea now, which kind of leads us into this next slide. So at the end, we want to kind of talk about, you know, where we're headed with Moat. This this slide, John wrote this slide, and I, every time I see it, I wince a little bit because it looks like we're announcing a product launch, but we're not. Um, but I guess what we're declaring victory on is over the past year, um, we feel like we've figured out what Moat 1.1, what Moat 1.0 should be. Yep. We haven't finished building it yet, <laughs> but at least we have figured out what it is and we have started working on it. And, you know, so I think some of this ties back also to those thinking about those narrative performance, you know, motivators at the beginning and, and realizing that we could tick more boxes there. 
right? And so, you know, part of that is, you know, creating a more dynamic reading mode, something that allows you to really explore a, a like the, the after effect, the artifact of a performance as an artifact of performance and not just something static, right? So something where you can continue to manipulate the perspective that you read the story from, even to be able to continue to manipulate the, the, the tense that the story is written in um, as, as a way of exploring um, an artifact of performance rather than simply a, 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 a written text, right? Um, you know, we also, you know, want to enable people to put on a show, right? Mm -hmm. That public spectacle is a huge motivator for people to want to perform. Yeah, I mean, you want to show off what you practice, right? right? Like if you if you achieve something and you feel like you're really good at it, yeah. you know, you 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 kind of want the folks to stop by and yeah. see what you've been doing. Every so some of that is enabling people to, you know. A, have an audience for their play, right? Mm -hmm. And to allow people to spectate on their play and on their on their story. And part of that is also allowing people to react to the things that are happening in sort of like an out of character way, mm -hmm. uh, calling these reactions, right? And th this could be player to player reaction, right? Where you're playing with another person and you're able to kind of vibe with them. You can see them laugh at your jokes, right? Yeah. Um, but not just on the Zoom that you've got open in the yeah. other window, right? Or, um, you know, even to, to be able to someday have an audience be able to react and, and yeah. mimic what you get from some of that great feedback and energy that you get that, that fuels so many live performances, the energy between the players mm -hmm. and the energy between the players and the audience. Um, and then also to be able to start creating the artifacts of these performances is something that can be further edited and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and continued to be played with. Um, and uh, and manipulated even to be able to take an existing story that you created through play and jump in and, and replay a section right and um, uh, you know kind of trying to enable some of that that higher order creation that can happen mm -hmm. when you've got a recorded performance the cool thing we're working with is we don't just have text we have you know a recording of the way that that text was performed it's a historical record it's kind of like a it kind of ends up being like a MIDI sequencer yeah. it, at one point I was actually exploring if we could use music in some yeah. way um, within our within our technology because it is to me so much like MIDI um, the 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 way that all of this gets modeled under the hood um, so, as a sequence of cues. So you know? like so MIDI for example, just for people who don't know, is a way that you can use a keyboard to play uh, a song. And rather than it recording the audio, it records the actual events and inputs. It records the performance. Of the performance yeah. on the thing, including how hard you hit the keys, all of your kind of, you know, the, the times you slow down, the times you become soft, the times you become loud. And you can remap that performance to any other software instrument. Even in the future, you can save the MIDI as a file and later play it with a new software instrument that yeah. it wasn't created for. And that's actually a cool way where digital technology allows us to break some of the rules that we set out at the beginning about instruments, about them being so specific. Yeah. Right? It's well, and it, so the, what we finally see mode as is this ability to actually come in, you're telling a story with your friends, you're producing this prose rendered output, but then you're able to actually dive into that prose. You're able to use that performance data, the cue data, the, the event data to actually give you these incredibly fluid um, editing tools. It allows you to create uh, documents. Imagine a chapter of a book where you want to read it from a certain character's perspective. And so you just click a couple of buttons and you're reading it from that person's first person perspective, that character's, or you want to read it in the present tense. So you switch it over from the, the past tense. All of this is possible with narrative instruments and with prose's performance and these narratives, these narrative performances. Um, because of that information and that data that's on there. So that's what I find most exciting about it. Sorry, I got into it. <laughs> no, that's great. So that's our talk. Um, and, you know, our, our closing message to you is come play with us. Um, you know, if you're interested in, you know, what's going on with narrative instruments, if you're working on something that you think might be a narrative instrument or you know is a narrative instrument mm -hmm. and you want to teach us about it, we would love to hear from you. We would love to see what you create. We would love to play with you. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more about Moat, you can find us at whatismoat.com. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you us. to Nariscope for having us again this year. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. And